Anytime I get an opportunity to speak, I consider it a blessing to stand before you guys because I want to sit in the seats that you're sitting in and I didn't get that opportunity at this level. But right now, as you're moving up in the college football ranks, this university was under the microscope because you had to prove yourself. But once you won that national championship, you're in the spotlight now. The spotlight sees you different. When you move, the light moves, it eliminates what's great. So as you move up, I understand that because I lived my whole entire life under a microscope. Now it's in the spotlight, so I have a responsibility to the way I move. Y'all was a big time at the level you were, now you're moving up, but the standard is still the standard. I heard your coach say that. You were the best at your level, but I'm gonna take it up a notch. I'm gonna challenge you to be the only, because you're the only class to ever win a national championship in Huntsville, right? It's a difference between the being the best and the only. The reason the world stopped when Kobe Bryant died, not because he was the best, it's because he's the only. It's a difference to the standard, right? If you're living your dream, I want you to raise your hand right now. Just like you, I had a dream. Growing up in this West Texas town known for football and oil. As a young boy, the only person that I had a chance to ask about my dream was my mother. And I went to my mother and I said, Mama, if it ain't too much to ask for Christmas, can you get me a football so I can chase this dream of becoming a football player? And my mama had this look in her eyes that she wasn't for certain that she could fulfill this request. It wasn't because mama didn't have a job, but she didn't have the money. You've all seen my mama before, out in front of Walgreens, H-E-B, ringing the bell for the Salvation Army. That's who my mama was, she had a heart to serve. But when she got paid, you might see in the back room in your neighborhood, because she was addicted to crack cocaine. And if she used all her money on the drugs, you might see at another house because she was a prostitute. That wasn't who my mama was, that's what she did. But when Christmas came in our apartment complex in that back room, it was a Christmas tree that didn't have many ornaments, didn't have many decoration, but up under it had two presents. One was a football and I would grab that football and I would run around my apartment complex every day trying to chase my dream. New Year's Eve, my mother comes to me and my brother and says, boys, I'm going out for the evening. If you need anything, go to the neighbor's house and make sure you're in the house before it gets dark, right? And I listen to my mom and I tell my brother, I says, stay out here and play football with me. He says, no, I'm gonna go next door and play Nintendo. Because he was fascinated with this idea of Super Mario Brothers and saving the princess. So he said, you stay out here and chase your dream. Understand, man, in this thing called life, people are gonna give up on you on your dream. Your responsibility is your own self to fulfill your own dream. That day was my family. My brother gave up on me in my dream. I stayed outside and I played with that football until it got dark. So I listened to my mama, so I decided to go home. And I left the door unlocked for my brother and my mother to come home because we only had one key to the house. And I go upstairs as I'm in the bed, and a moments later I hear footsteps coming down the hallway and I really get excited because I think it's my brother coming home or my mother coming home. But the footsteps was a man that I never seen before. And he comes and sits on the edge of the bed like he's gonna read me a bedtime story. And he looks at me and he says, boy, where's your mama? She stole my money. And before I can answer, the man grabbed me by the head and stabbed me in the neck with a screwdriver. Now this dream is starting to bleed out of this nine-year-old boy. But the next question I got for everybody in the room, what's bleeding you out of your dream? Are you the one holding the knife to your neck? What's bleeding you, dog? You're a national championship team. And something outside of this room is bleeding you. Is it that girl? Is it you missing curfew? Is it that uncle in your neighborhood telling you he's better than you? What's bleeding you, dog? Cut them off if it's not success. Don't get bled out of your opportunity to be a part of this university. Now I'm fighting for this dream. It's keeping me alive. Understand, I see my dream slipping away. How do I see my dream slipping away? Because the ball represents my dream. And everybody said, Tiki, do you remember the guy that attacked you? Say, oh, absolutely. I remember exactly what he looked like. I only thing I remember is the bottom of his blue jeans and his snakeskin boots. Why? Because it was standing right next to my dream, which was the football and he runs away. So I roll from up under the bed and I grab my ball and I go next door where my brother's playing Nintendo. And I bang on the door, he answers and I fall in his arm and I say, brother, don't save the princess, save me. Same boy, 17, starting to live his dream, become number, running back number one at his local high school, right? And that dream was over as quick as it started because I was accused of a crime and sent to jail in the middle of my senior year in high school. But I got a question for Jordan Yates, right? If you went to jail at 17, who's the first person to come visit you? Your mom, right? 
You're absolutely right. When I went to jail at 17, my mom was the first person to come see me, right? But the twist to this story, she was locked up the same time I was, on her way to prison for murder. So the powers that be allowed me and my mama to have an in-house son, mother visit. And I walk into the visitation room, I said, but mama, I, I, I didn't do what they said I did, I can get life. And she looked at me and said, me too, baby, and I love you, and turned and walked away. So just imagine the woman that put the ball in your hand, the woman that said all this dream is possible is giving up on you. Now if I had a chip on my shoulder, it's a boulder now, dog. So I go back to my jail cell and I tell all the inmates, when I get out here, I'm going to the NFL. When I get out here, I'm going to college and they would laugh at me. Six months later, I got out. I started working at a local dealership, making $5.25 an hour. And when I was washing cars for two years and a half, the owner of that dealership was paying attention to my work. And then he came to me. He says, I want to send you to college. So that next semester, I found myself at a university scoring touchdowns again. This thing called NFL was an option again. Two years of playing football at a small university, I had to look at myself in the mirror, and many of you are gonna have that fate. When I looked at myself in the mirror, I realized I wasn't good enough to go to the NFL. So I decided to put down the football and pick up the books, because I realized I just didn't want to be a player on the field of athletics, I want to be a player in life. The only reason I'm in this room today is not what I did on some football field, it's what I did in life. I'm a player now. When that stiff form wasn't good no more, that mindset kicked in like never before. Y'all don't understand, y'all helping me live a dream, connect the dots, the final chapter of this book. This is how the movie's gonna end with y'all today. So as I'm chasing this dream and I'm, I'm putting this, this ball down, my mama's in the prison, right? And I haven't talked to her other than letters in seven years, I'm 24 years old, I get this call from the prison, and it's my mama on the other line. I said, but mama, I got some bad news, and, and I kinda got, got a little good news. She said, what is it, baby? I said, well, mama, I'm not gonna be able to buy you that house because I'm not going to the NFL. She says, baby, that, that's okay, that's not so bad. What's the good news? I said, but mama, I'm gonna be the first player, I mean, the first person in our family to graduate college. She said, that's good. And she says, baby, I got some good news, too. And I said, what is it, mama? She says, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there. She says, I get out January the 6th. She said, the warden of the prison is gonna be calling you with instructions to get my property. Pick me up at January 6th in San Angelo, Texas at the bus station. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be there. And I expect the call from the warden. December the 31st, 2001, I received that call from that warden at the prison. She goes, Tiki, I said, yes, ma'am. She says, I just wanna let you know that Karen has expired. I said, yes, ma'am, I understand what you're saying. Mama's getting out in six times. She told me her time had expired. She said, you're gonna be calling. I was expecting you to call. She said, son, you don't understand. What you wanna do about burial arrangements? So at 24, I had to bury my mama in a Huntsville graveyard. Today's my first day ever coming back. My mama's buried down the street, dog. When I came here early today, I spent my whole day at the graveyard. First time in 20 years, I'm crying at my mama's grave. But when I came down here to Huntsville and identified the body, my mama had two black eyes, beat up, weighed 280 pounds, hair pulled out. She was murdered. But I couldn't fight, I couldn't say nothing then because I'm in the system. I'm thinking if I say something about my mama, I get life sentence. So I ate it. Then I go back to college after I bury my mama. Now let me go tell them how I became the only. So I went in to this oil company after getting turned down for about like 100 jobs, right? So I start working and I learned and I became the best engineer in the whole Permian Basin. Then I got laid off. And then nobody would hire me again. So I bought up a mobile car wash, so I'm washing cars again with this master's degree. Then I kept on working and then I ran into the number one independent oil man in the world named Clayton Williams Jr. And he gave me an opportunity to come work for him. So in four years, I took that $13 an hour to a million dollars a year and became the best engineer in the world. I'm telling you what I've grown through, gentlemen. But I know that's all good and everything, but y'all wanna know how did I do it? Write this down, put it in your phone. I'm gonna give you the Tiki Factor principles. How did I become one of the most successful guys in my generation? You gotta make a total commitment to your life first. Total commitment to your life. Whatever you're going through, whatever your struggle is right now, you gotta make a total commitment where you currently are in your life. The next thing 
in the Tiki Fact is imagination. I need you to live from your imagination and not your history because none of you are your history. You know, I have you know, some circumstances with my family upbringing that you know, I, I've made a choice to not, you know, to not go down that path. But that itself really struck a nerve with me because I could really feel like I could relate to them and then continue to do those things. And the next thing is, K, kindred spirits, the people around you affect you. Depending on who they are and what they do is gonna affect you in that type of way. And the last I is invest in yourself. I think a lot of our guys were like, yeah, you know, I mean, this is your life. And so everything you do to try to move forward and be successful is an investment in your life. And I, I thought it was so great when he was talking about how you know, maybe like he was very locked in and focused early in his life about just getting to that. Now he's reading, now he's meditating, now he's getting into church. I mean, you could see like he's starting to fulfill a lot more than just driving for that one goal to make that money and, and clear his name. There's also a lot of other things in his life. Total commitment, imagination, kindred spirits, and invest in yourself. Those are the tiki factor principles, and that's what I apply to my life. I had a bad name from 17 to 40. I'm 44 now. I just got my name back 44 years, I mean four years ago. And I'll do everything I can to keep it clean. So I challenge all you with your good name, being a part of a good program. Do everything you gotta do to keep your name. Be a part of this. It ain't about playing time, dog. It ain't about wins and losses. It's about protecting your good name and your character. I'm the Tiki Factor. That's my time. I appreciate you.